Welcome to this edition of Vital Voices um, for fall, spring 2021. Um, you, as you know, Vital Voices, we try to bring uh, people uh, to campus who have a background in criminal justice, urban education, um, or social work, or a combination of the three. And all of our guests speak, we ask them to speak directly from their heart on their experiences in their profession, both personally and professionally, and how the work they do affects society as a whole, um, especially on hot, hot topic, uh, hot button issues that are, are prominent in our society today. So I wanna let you know about two upcoming Vital Voices events that we're gonna have this year. Uh, uh, one month from today on Thursday, March 4th, we're gonna have Damon West, and Damon is, um, I'll read you from the description, Damon exchanged the American dream, dream for a dystopian nightmare. He went from quarterbacking his college football team and roaming the halls of Congress and trading on Wall Street to his addiction to meth and subsequent multi-million dollar crime spree that delivered him a life sentence in a Texas maximum security prison. And one day a, a convict shared an allegory with him that changed his life. Uh, it taught him that like a coffee bean, the power to change any situation comes from inside of you, not from the forces outside of you. So uh, Damon is now an adjunct professor in our criminal justice department. And he's gonna tell you his entire story of life pre, po uh, pre in and post prison. It's a remarkable story. So you don't wanna miss that. And then on Thursday, April 8th, uh, from one to 2.30, we are uh, gonna have Dr. Rachel Gentea, who is an assistant professor of medicine at the UT Health Science Center at Houston McGovern's Medical School. And she's the director of education on the Consortium on Aging. She's gonna to talk to us about how COVID-19 has highlighted aging issues in America. Uh, as you know, America's aging population is increasing and yet their needs are, are often marginalized. They're forgotten or they're misunderstood or they're, they're completely missed entirely. So awareness is the first step toward advocacy. So uh, even if you don't personally have an older person in your life, uh, the impact on uh, older of older care in America really truly affects everybody. So that'll be a good discussion on uh, Thursday, April 8th. So that's it for this season. So uh, let me get right to it. I'm gonna pass the baton to uh, the Dean of our College of Public Service, uh, John Schwartz. He came to us almost two years ago uh, it's amazing how, how quickly the time flies. And uh, the Dean has really uh, revolutionized this college. And so I am proud to uh, present you to our Dean, Dean John Schwartz. Take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Volato. Uh, I'm just gonna talk briefly a little bit about our college. So we are the College of Public Service, which is kind of a unique title in universities. And we have programs in education, in criminal justice and in social work. Uh, and we are very passionate about service, uh, about making a difference in the community, especially of downtown Houston. Uh, we have award-winning programs. Our criminal justice program, again, is nationally ranked our master's in criminal justice by US News and World Report. Uh, we, we have award-winning programs also in urban education and in social work. So we really try and combine those together to figure out how to make a difference in Houston and beyond. Uh, we're passionate about that. We're passionate about our students' success and contributing to that success. Uh, so I'm glad you've taken this opportunity to visit us and to see our Vital Voices. I think this is a very exciting Vital Voices. Uh, I actually follow Carrie Blankinger on Twitter and keep updated with all the things she posts about what's going on in Texas related to criminal justice. Uh, we think hard about criminal justice issues here and about how to, how to be advocates and make a positive difference for progressive criminal justice in Houston and beyond. So I think this is a really exciting one. I'm glad you, you've joined us. And I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Buckler, who's a full professor at the University of Houston downtown in our criminal justice program and an accomplished researcher and is the one responsible for bringing Ms. Blankinger to us today. Thank you, Dean Schwartz, and welcome, everyone. Um, want to introduce Carrie. Carrie Lakinger is a journalist with the Marshall Project, 
This is a nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization that's dedicated to sustaining a sense of national urgency on issues of criminal justice. She is the Marshall Project's first formerly incarcerated journalist. In her work, she primarily covers prisons and prosecutors. Prior to joining the Marshall Project, Carrie was a journalist for the uh, Houston Chronicle. And before that, she was a staff writer for the Ithaca Times. Her work has been featured in the Washington Post Magazine, Vice, the New York Daily News, and on N NBC News. She's currently working on a memoir which will be published by St. Martin's Press. News media is often called the fourth estate in importance rivaling the executive, legislative, and judicial functions of government. Historically, we've acknowledged the importance of a free and independent press and its capacity to provide advocacy and to frame social and political issues. Journalism is vitally important to our Republic and its value of democracy. So particularly in current times, we should celebrate journalism that really hits the mark and advances the interest of those among us who are marginalized and lack social and political power. I reached out to Carrie about the potential for doing this Vital Voices for a few reasons. First, her story and approach to telling it is absolutely captivating. And second, Carrie is in a position as a journalist to inform the public about criminal justice through a very unique lens and is well positioned to influence how criminal justice journalism gets done. We have both criminal justice and social work faculty and students here today. I think you'll see over the next hour or so that Carrie's work as a journalist is important for both disciplines of study. I'm pleased to introduce Carrie Blakinger. Hey, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm just going to start here. I'm going to talk some in the beginning and then we'll have a bunch of time for questions. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the talking part like short-ish, like half an hour or so, I, I guess. I don't know. I haven't really timed it. Um, and just, uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions about things I do touch on or things I don't if you have specific stories you've been wanting to ask about or tweet at me afterwards. But I'm going to start with um, when I went to prison you know, sort of start at where uh, my own introduction to the prison system. People ask me all the time now still, you know, if I was scared to go to prison. And I mean, of course I was like, who, who isn't, right? Um, even the parole violators that I met in jail who had been to prison before and were going back, like, you know, they were still scared to go to the prison. It's like, um, you know, it's like going to hell or like going to war. Like, it's one of those things that you're sort of, it's never not scary, right? Um, but one of the things that I learned in the first day in prison was that the things that you should be scared of are not the things that you think you should be scared of in prison. Um, the first night there, I barely slept. I None of us slept, actually. Um, we got there at like noon um, after 10 months in the county jail. Uh, I had been waiting around in the county jail to go to prison. And um, for anyone who you know doesn't know me or hasn't Googled or whatever, I was a heroin addict and I was doing time for a drug charge. And after all these months of waiting in this small county jail, you know, it was like capacity of you know 90, 100 people, um, I was finally sentenced to prison and I was heading um, upstate to you know big leagues or whatever. And uh, that morning, so Monday morning when they did all the transports, there were two guards that drove me from Ithaca to Albion, which is a prison just outside of Rochester. This was all happening in upstate New York. Um, and the place uh, looks like a college campus. Mm -hmm. Like there's uh, old brick buildings and like black top walkways and like grassy areas. But, you know, of course there's like security grading on all the windows and there's razor wire and there's guards and there's guns. Um, and, you know, that morning when I showed up, it was around the same time as like eight or 10 other people. We were all being driven in from different counties and we knew we were all there for just a day um, because that's how it works in New York. If you're upstate, if you're in the northern part of the state, 
they transport you all to the closest prison and you spend one night there and then you go down to the maximum security prison Bedford Hills for classification and reception and then you know they send you to whatever prison you're going to end up in so we show up and you know everything is taken from us you know we're stripped naked you you know have to lift up each breast you have to squat and cough and take like delousing shower um in you know cold water and you have to stand there with the delousing shampoo on you and you know you're all naked and there's a naked woman next to me on one side and on the other side and the one is just crying hysterically the whole time this elderly woman crying for like two straight hours and you know this was my first few hours in prison and then they have us wait in this like tiny room for four hours prison is just so much waiting like there is so much useless time just spent waiting in prison as we learned on day one and you know we're just waiting in this sort of barren room watching this suicide prevention video on repeat because that was the only thing they had on the tv and then after i don't know four or five hours of waiting there they send us to the dorm where we're going that night and it literally looked like a harvard dorm like old um like brick building wooden floors like uh it, it had those you know dorm rooms where you have like a door like not cell bars like a, a door and there's like bunk beds and um they just sort of left they locked us in this wing and left us unattended for the night and there was no clock no radio no tv i think there was like one book or something and there was a deck of cards. So we just had like a deck of cards and each other. And we stayed up all night, eight or 10 of us, nervous and you know playing spades and like peering out the windows through the security glass and looking at all the women that had been there longer and you know trying to sort of guess which prison we'd end up in like this you know really dark and depressing version of Harry Potter's sorting hat. Um, but that was it, that was our night. Like, nothing terrible happened. We stayed up and we played cards and we just, you know, bonded and like shared our fears. And it was just a bunch of women talking all night. And in the morning, they got us up at like 4 a.m. and made us go spend another four or so hours just waiting in a barren room with a wooden bench. And we were waiting for the bus to come and get us and take us to Bedford. And um, at one point I was overhearing a couple guards who were standing in the room and they were, you know, they were talking about this girl who was in solitary confinement. And um, I don't know, you know, what she'd done to get there, or how long she'd been there, or if she was like mentally ill or just, you know, angry and being spiteful, like, I don't know. But apparently she had taken a tray and taken a shit on it and pushed it back out the, um, out the slot at the guards. And in retaliation, the guards had turned off the water to herself. So like no sink, no drinking water, no way to flush, like no water, not for 20 minutes. Like they were leaving it off. And they were talking about it with each other. And the one was like, well, like, what is she gonna drink? And the other one was like, well, you know, she can drink out of the toilet. If it's good enough for my dog, it's good enough for her, you know? If I heard that now, um, I, having covered the system for years and having written so much about it, like I don't think I'd be terribly shocked. But hearing that then on my first day of prison, um, I, was, I was appalled. And the sound of that man's voice as he was saying this is just seared into my brain because I think that was sort of the moment at which I realized, you know, what I was dealing with here. I'd been in jail, I, you know, but jail kind of low stakes and, um, you're not really seeing the bigger picture. But hearing that in prison um, really drove home to me what prison is about. It's, you know, it's killing time, it's pointless, it's, um, you know, can be unexpectedly cruel and counterproductive. And, you know, sure, you find these like sort of moments of joy every so often, you know, playing cards at 4 a.m., um, you know, bonding with other women, but that's in spite of the system, not because not the other prisoners, it's the prison. So for anyone who doesn't know me, um, I guess this also all begs the question as to how I got to prison in the first place. 
Um, I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in the heart of Amish country. No, I'm not Amish. I don't know why people insist on asking that, even when they see me on the internet. I'm not Amish, never been Amish. Um, but, you know, my mom was a teacher, my dad's a lawyer. I had a pretty normal, like, suburban upbringing, um, except that I was a competitive figure skater. So I was an elite athlete at a young age. And um, I skated pairs, which is where the guy throws you around and it looks all dangerous and shit. And we were, you know, we were good. We competed at nationals twice. We were fifth both times. Um, skating was my whole life. I would get up at like, you know, I, I would after I would leave school at like 10 in the morning and I'd be at the rink until six. And it was sort of my whole world and um, my whole life and identity really. So when my pair partner decided to branch out and try to find another partner, um, I just, I fell apart. I was 17 at that point and I sort of went off the deep end, not sort of, totally did, and uh, was doing drugs for like 10 years. In that time, I was doing sex work, I was homeless, I was in school some, I was not in school, I was in rehab, I was in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, I, I was, you know, all over the place. Um, and at one point I, I jumped off a bridge uh, trying to kill myself, um, but I survived and just ended up with, you know, more prescriptions to painkillers as a result. In the end, by 2010, I was heavily addicted to heroin and I was selling heroin um, while I was in college. And it was at the end of what should have been my senior semester that I got arrested, the second semester of my senior year, that I got arrested walking down the street with a Tupperware full of heroin. And so, you know, I ended up in jail uh, knowing nothing about the criminal justice system. So I think for those of us who work in the criminal justice space now, it is almost difficult to understand or remember fully like not knowing anything about the criminal justice system. But like, I didn't know, for instance, the difference between jail and prison, which for anyone who's not involved in criminal justice, jail is um, county jail. So it's pre-trial, it's like before you're sentenced or it's if you're sentenced usually to like less than a year in a lot of states, you'll end up doing your time in the county jail. So it's, it's local, it's nearby, it's run by the, the sheriffs. Prison is if you're sentenced to, uh, you know, more than a year is what it is in most states. Um, so it's sort of the big leagues and it's usually run by the state, although there's federal prisons as well. I use those terms, I, I used those terms interchangeably. I, I didn't know the difference. I didn't know what an arraignment was. I didn't know how you got a lawyer. Um, I literally didn't know if my charges were serious, which they were. Um, I was arrested with about six ounces of heroin, which is, um, a, it was like a Tupperware container like that size maybe. So it's a decent amount, but not, um, not like narco trafficking amount, but it, you know, is not personal use amount either. Um, I think it's difficult though to quite understand how disorienting going into a system that you so thoroughly don't understand really is. Um, you know, I was also high at the time of my arrest. So I would be like waking up and there's some lady asking me questions about like my religious affiliation. And then she's telling me to take delousing shower. And, you know, I've, I've never had lice before. Like I have no idea. I've never done this before. I've never done any of this shit. You know, she's ordering me to like squat and cough. And, you know, I don't even know what's optional or what happens if I don't listen. You know, I don't like on TV, you, you hear you're going to get a phone call. I, I didn't get a phone call. You know, wh when am I going to see a judge? Like, you know, she, she wouldn't answer. And the person, the person who was booking me into jail the day I got arrested wouldn't answer my questions. She just sort of looked at me like I was stupid and, you know, locked me in a cell. Um, and I had no idea what comes next. Like I'm, I know that I've been arrested. It, you know, I don't know if it's a serious charge, don't know how to get a lawyer. I just know that I'm in the cell for an unknown and indefinite amount of time and no one will answer my questions. And that's, that's very deeply disorienting. I think in a way that I maybe didn't even fully 
understand at the time until I learned more about the system and found out what exactly it is that I didn't know at the time. But the whole system, like prison, jail, incarceration is disorienting, not just on day one, but like as a rule, that's how the system works. Um, there's a really great video on the Marshall Project site. It's called The Zoe. And it's somebody describing prison and incarceration generally as being like the twilight zone. You know, you sort of, you go in and all the rules are different, like words mean different things. There's this whole other sort of slang. And then there's this whole, um, there's this whole world of rules that you can't necessarily follow or don't make sense. And it's just almost, per it, it feels almost purposely disorienting. For instance, like you might be required to be at a certain place at a certain time, but the guard won't actually let you out to be there. Or you have a scheduled legal call at a certain time, but you have no way to tell what time it is. So you don't know when to make the call. Or you would ask the officers what time it was and they would literally lie to you about the time just to mess with you. Um, you know, or I mean, it's just smaller things too, like sort of being addressed only as a number for years. You know, I was 11 G0845 when I was in prison. And it sort of, it all adds up to being deeply disorienting in a way that you don't sort of realize at the moment, but it adds up over time. And, you know, I think that's important when we think about the purpose that prison serves and the lessons that we teach people from being incarcerated. If it's simply disorienting and not rehabilitative, like we really have to ask some questions about what this achieves. Um, but, you know, stepping back um, to jail, <laughs> um, I, when I was in jail, I, I ended up being in jail for about 10 months. Like I said, I got sentenced to two and a half years and I did about half of that time in jail and about half that time in prison. I actually didn't do the whole two and a half years. I got out after 21 months. Um, that just based on how good time works in New York. Um, that was, you know, that it was five sevenths of the time that I was going to do. Um, the details of how much time you do in prison vary by state a lot. Um, one thing I get asked a lot is what role race played in my sentence. Um, you know, did I benefit from white privilege? Um, would I have gotten a harsher sentence if I were a person of color? And I mean, I, I think in short, the answer is yes, but there's, it's a more nuanced answer than that um, in some ways. And I just think this is an important moment to make sure to talk about these things. Um, I was arrested and sentenced in such a liberal county that uh, a lot of people were actually surprised at how uh, harsh my sentence was. So if you look at it by that standard, like you might think that I didn't benefit from white privilege, but I, you know, 100% did. Um, I think that if I had been a person of color, there are not lighter, certainly, um, sent so other way around. It's not clear to what extent I would have gotten a harsher or lighter sentence. And I meant to say I would not, I did not get a lighter Did I also benefited just from the dumb luck of timing and location. I, I was arrested in a liberal county. If I'd been arrested, you know, a county over, um, I probably would have gotten like 20 years, um, 10 to 20 years, I, I think, depending on the specific county. And um, timing. When I got arrested, it was just after Rockefeller laws had been um, and had been repealed. They'd been getting repealed gradually over um, over a several year period. Uh, but when I got arrested, they had just repealed another part of it like a year earlier. And if I'd been sentenced under the old laws, I would have been doing 15 to life. So I was um, I was incredibly lucky about the timing, the location. And, you know, obviously I benefited from, you know, from white privilege in this, in, in this situation. Um, I also didn't realize at the time um, the ways in which white privilege benefited me after I went to prison. And that's because, I'm, I'm sorry, is there somebody, am I hearing someone else's audio here? 
like I, I don't I, I feel like I'm hearing sound in the background. I, I, don't, um, I don't hear it. Um, okay. I don't have any other sound going. That's very weird. Anyways, uh, okay, I'm just, let me know if anybody starts hearing feedback or whatever. Um, anyways, on to race in prison. So one of the other points in the justice system at which race, I mean, I, I think obviously race plays a role at pretty much every point, right? One of the ways that I didn't realize at the time and sort of realized later was the extent to which it influences your experience in prison. Um, and I don't just mean your, your interactions with each other, which clearly, you know, can play a role there, but also just the amount of time that you do, because disproportionately people of color end up in solitary. And aside from the actual trauma and awfulness of solitary, there is, that also means that you're less likely to make parole. Um, when I was in prison, like we knew that uh, if you were a person of color, it was well understood that the upstate prisons were worst places to be because those are in largely white rural areas that are very conservative. And, um, you know, it was sort of understood that if the, I remember when we were getting transferred from Bedford Hills near New York City area up to upstate that the black women were like, shit. Um, and, you know, I didn't realize that that was more than sort of anecdotal. Um, I didn't realize that, that, that there were statistics to, that would show that this is sort of everywhere. This is something that happens everywhere. Um, but what it means is that, you know, this isn't, race doesn't just impact, you know, who has a who has more arrests and ends up with more time. It doesn't just impact, you know, who gets profiled and arrested. It doesn't just impact sentencing. It also impacts like how much time you do and what your prison experience looks like and, you know, how much discipline you face. And, you know, a lot of times that discipline means trauma. Um, you know, so, so this is one of many things, like I think I've mentioned this a few times at this point that I didn't really fully understand until after I got out of prison and was um, and was looking back on it. I, in the course of um, writing a book, which I'm doing now, I started to realize to what extent it is that I didn't see the sort of bigger picture at the time. Um, you know, I people in prison obviously know what's going on in prison, but so often I think you're unable to see the big picture when you're on the inside. Um, I am, I guess, in the lucky or unlucky um, position of being able to see both of these now, as in I cover criminal justice, so I see the data, I see the big picture, but I've also been there. So I understand what it looks like from the inside as well. Um, that does turn out to be very helpful as a journalist um, and, you know, I guess I, I realize I've skipped a lot here in terms of how I got from prison to a uh, journalist. Um, so I'm just going to sort of quickly recap some of the, some of my path there. And I anticipate that you guys will have more questions as I, um, once I'm done, I'm happy to answer more about, you know, how I got from journalist. Um, but in short, I got out in 2012. Um, I started rebuilding my life in the country in the middle of nowhere. Um, I started with, um, I didn't have a car. I didn't have any transportation, like there was no buses nearby. So I started with uh, a job I found on Craigslist, writing uh, trivia questions for a Korean trivia site. And then I, uh, I eventually got back into Cornell and finished my last two classes there. I only had two classes left to graduation at that point, which was you know, incredibly lucky. Um, and I got hired at the Ithaca Times, which was you know, a small paper in upstate New York. And I started off by covering town board meetings in a town with like 5,000 people. Um, and you know, I, I 
covered a lot of arguments about backyard chickens and uh, stoplights and things like that. Um, but after about a year and a half there, I, uh, I took a job at the New York Daily News and I was covering mostly breaking news there. Um, and then I moved to the Houston Chronicle where I eventually started covering criminal justice in prisons, but that was actually not where I started. And I had no desire to be covering that necessarily. Um, it wasn't that I was opposed to it, but when the death penalty reporter, Alan Turner retired, my editor was like, hey, do you, do you wanna consider covering death row some? And I, I was interested, I, I wasn't like super attached to it, but I was willing to give it a try. And uh, in the course of covering that, I realized that covering death row and prisons generally and criminal justice more broadly was something that I was actually really good at and sort of really well suited to. Um, I think that I think that the thing that sort of made me realize that was uh, a story that I think a lot of people associate with me now is about teep. Um, a few months into covering death row, I was having tacos with some murderabilia dealers, which I know is a weird sentence to say as I say it, but uh, murderabilia dealers are people that sell swag from like, you know, murders, like, toenails from serial killers and weird shit like that. And for me as a reporter, it seemed useful in terms of sources because they would know prisoners. They would know people on death row. They would know people who'd done a lot of time. And I was just sort of casting about to find out what were stories that I should be writing about that aren't covered. Um, and one of them mentioned, oh yeah, they're all gonna get dentures on death row all the guys that don't have teeth. And I was like, oh, that seems like a happy story. Well, it wasn't true. They were not gonna get dentures. And in the course of asking around about that, I learned that it was not Texas prison policy to give people dentures, which was shocking to me because in New York, you did get dentures. Like the women that I was with that didn't have teeth could get dentures. So I started poking around, found out that their policy was actually if you had, all, if you'd lost all your teeth or had them pulled or whatever, uh, they would just put your food in a blender and literally puree a regular mess hall meal and give it to you in a cup. Um, sometimes it wasn't in a cup, I guess that's that specific detail on whether they blended the, the things all together or separate depends on the prison because I've heard different reports about that. Um, but this is something that no one had written about. And it's been going on for more than 15 years at that point. And I, so I think that this is sort of a moment at which I realized like, oh, well, I'm thinking about teeth. And maybe this is a thing that other reporters um, didn't think about as much. But, you know, I remember going to the prison dentist. I remember, you know, the, the sort of dental care that people would often come into prison with. You know, these are people that I spent time around. And I, I understood, you know. So um, I started writing about the lack of dentures. It took me several months of investigating and trying to figure out what their exact policy was, how their policy had changed over time, um, how the number of dentures that they would give out had decreased over time. So I ended up poking into it for like almost a year. And then when I actually wrote the story, they changed policy as a result. And they said that they would, you know, start giving people more dentures. And then the prison system bought 3D bought a 3D printer at one unit to um, print dentures for everyone. Now, you know, that, that slowed down because of COVID and there's, um, there's still a long way to go. Like there's a lot of people in Texas prisons that still do not have teeth. Um, but for me, that was sort of eye-opening in that I realized that this was a way in which my specific experience could be helpful to shedding light on sort of bigger problems. Um, you know, and I've also, I've also talked a few times about, I've mentioned this repeatedly, this idea that like what I saw in prison seemed anecdotal. And after getting out, I realized that it was broader. And I think that's true when it comes to dental care. I saw plenty of bad dental care in prison. I got out, I realized it was actually a systemic problem in some different ways that it hadn't been where I'd done time. And 
you know, I, I think the same is true about that story I told at the beginning when I was um, talking about the officers turning off the water in the woman's cell. Those kinds of conditions are a thing that at the time I thought was sort of an exception, a one-off, a thing that you wouldn't see elsewhere. And, you know, to be clear, I, I haven't found some, you know, broad conspiracy to turn off everyone's water. But I do find that there are some consistently shocking conditions that, um, you know, I learn more about every day. Um, you know, I think a lot of this is exacerbated by COVID and I'm, I'm glad to answer more questions afterwards about the impact of COVID on the prison system because that's been, you know, most of my past year reporting on that. But when COVID hit in Texas, we had about 145,000 people in prison. And as I'm sure anyone who's like sort of aware of the criminal justice space that is watching this, I'm sure as you know, um, prisoners come in in you know worse shape medically than the rest of the general population is. Like prisoners have higher rates of asthma and heart disease and basically any sort of underlying condition. It, it's almost always uh, more pronounced in the prison population. They're also aging. Um, you know they don't have any ability to social distance. Uh, although some prisons have cells, a lot of prisons are like dorm style. So, you know, you can't sleep, like even if you're literally in bed sleeping, you're not necessarily six feet away from another person. Also, some of the basic preventive measures that we're able to enjoy on the outside, you know, hand sanitizer, um, you know, easier access to masks, like those things just don't exist in prison. You can't have hand sanitizer. Um, it's been difficult to consistently get masks. Um, I've seen plenty of, you know, video and photo evidence that people are not, officers, sometimes prisoners are not necessarily wearing their masks. So, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of people that are aware of what's going on in the criminal justice space understood that a pandemic like this in a prison system was going to be bad, right? Like far worse than in the free world. And the numbers have borne that out. We've seen much higher death rates and much higher infection rates in prisons. As of like several months ago, um, I think it's, it was like in the fall, we reported that it was at least a fifth of prisoners had tested positive. Um, and this is not even accounting for the fact that, you know, many of them were not getting adequate levels of testing. Um, but during all of this, the prison conditions also get worse at the same time. Part of this is because of the nature of how prisons deal with things like pandemics, which is usually in a lockdown. Uh, more than 300,000 prisoners nationwide, probably substantially more, but when I added it up, it was at least 300,000, have been uh, in prisons that were locked down during this pandemic. And what lockdown means is that you know, you're in your cell all the time, you're not getting phone calls, you're not getting to see your family, you're not getting any sort of programming. In Texas, it means that you're getting delivered food that is often um, gross. It's, uh, you know, bagged meals that are typically sandwiches-ish kind of sandwiches. I, you know, I should have probably um, had these pictures to show, but um, I've written about the sorts of food that people were being served during lockdowns when they were getting these bag lunches that are, you know, sandwiches that are sometimes just a piece of bread or a moldy hot dog and a piece of bread. And, you know, I've seen plenty of bad prison food when I was in prison, but again, this is a situation where I didn't sort of see the bigger picture and realize, um, that hair that I found in my food or that time that I saw a cockroach crawl, crawl out of someone's cereal, that that wasn't like an aberration. That wasn't a one-off. In some states that happened, you know, terrible food is the norm. And the sort of extraordinary thing about this pandemic and the lockdowns is that it's made people desperate enough that they've been more willing to reach out and help shed light on these conditions. I've actually... Um, never gotten as many, I've never gotten as, as much contact from people on the inside with evidence as I have during the pandemic. And I think it's, you know, just because of the desperation, they've been willing to reach out with, um, you know, contraband cell phones, and they've been willing to send pictures and videos from the inside that help document conditions in a way that, you know, I haven't, I hadn't seen before. 
Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been a really difficult time to cover prisons, obviously. There's so many heartbreaking stories happening um, in the world, obviously with the pandemic, but also specifically in prisons. Um, but it's also been a sort of amazing time in that it's, it's been easier to shed light on some really terrible things than it might have been otherwise. Um, another thing that, another thing that I'm, aside from, aside from all the videos that I've gotten about food, the other thing that I got that was really eye-opening to me was videos about fires. Um, I didn't, in, in women's prison in New York, we didn't just set fire to things. Um, but in Texas prisons, when there's a lockdown, um, if prisoners can't get their basic needs met, if they're you know not getting fed or they're not getting showered, um, in some prisons, one of their responses is to start fires. And I had heard this, um, I'd heard this from people who'd done time, you know, I'd heard this from staff, but it wasn't until during the pandemic that I actually saw it, that people sent videos of fires just burning freely in the cell box or in the pods, they call them pods here. Um, and officers not putting them out, just sort of letting them burn out. Um, I wrote a story about this. We used some of the video of the fires in the story. Um, but it's important to understand, I should note that this is not just prisoners trying to cause trouble doing this. When prisoners are starting fires, I mean, sure, in some cases they may be just trying to cause trouble. In some cases they may be having a mental health issue, but commonly they tell me that they are doing it because they wanted to um, attract attention from the higher ups. If you start a fire, they have to call in, you know, a sergeant, a lieutenant, someone higher up to deal with it. So if the guards won't give you food, starting a fire might be your way to get attention from the lieutenant. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, I mean, this is just one of the really shocking conditions that we've seen during the pandemic. Fires existed beforehand in prison, but they seem to be happening more frequently now. We don't really have good data on it. Um, but when you sort of combine the personal risk um, from the disease, the uh, difficulty in controlling it in the prison environment and the bad conditions, the lockdowns, the food, the fires, um, it's, a, it's a really difficult world to be covering right now. And, you know, frankly, there's no indication that this is gonna get better in the immediate future. Currently have like 120,000 people in prison. There's actually been a huge decrease in the prison population, which is not due to people being released. It's mainly due to, you know, new people not coming in as much. Um, but we have outbreaks all over. There's an outbreak on death row right now. And, you know, they haven't started vaccinating prisoners yet. They've started vaccinating some staff. And even if they get enough vaccines for all the prisoners, there's still gonna be issues with prisoners not wanting to be vaccinated. There's a significant mistrust of the medical care, which as I've, you know, as I've described the, their approach to dealing with dental care, it's probably not surprising that they might, that people might not trust um, the prison system's medical care. So I think we have a long ways to go in terms of COVID in prison um, and what the conditions look like moving ahead. Um, and you know that's something I can talk about more. I can I can uh, answer more questions about covering about COVID in prisons, about covering COVID in prisons, about my own journey, whatever. Um, but I do want to sort of leave you with one reminder: as people who are in the free world and working in this criminal justice space, and that is that you know the people who are in prison really do know what's going on there, and there are always things to learn for them from them. I think that as people on the outside, it's so easy to think, well, we are the ones that have access to the internet in the broader context here. And I feel like a lot of the discussions that I see um, occurring online and occurring publicly are about prisoners and not um, with prisoners 
or not with their perspectives. So I think it's really important when you're thinking about criminal justice um, to actually include the thoughts of people in prison, not just their well-being, but you know their actual perspectives. Um, so that is all I have for now. I, it's very weird talking on Zoom and um, I can't see if anyone, I don't know if y'all are oh. out there booing or whatever. No, we, ha we actually have, we have a lot of okay. questions for you. Okay, so good. I'm gonna, I'll start here. So um, we, uh, one more person wants to know, what are some of the worst ways uh, Texas Department of Criminal Justice or any other state level department that deals with prisoners obscure prison conditions or abuse of incarcerated people? Well, so, I mean, I think the nature of prisons, I mean, there's a, there's a few answers to that. One thing is simply just the nature of prisons. Like you're not allowed to, to have a cell phone in there. You're not allowed to take pictures. Like obviously people do, but it just makes, uh, even if they're not sort of actively trying to hide anything, if which often they are, but even if they're not, just the fact that you can't, uh, document interactions like in the free world if the cops start beating someone up someone else can video it like you can't do that in prison and if you do you have to commit a felony to do it you know getting that cell phone like that it's a felony to have a cell for you know prisoners to have cell phones so I think on a very basic level just the the setup the structure of prisons and you know the fact that you can't document things um, you know, makes it really easy to cover up conditions. The other thing is, I find that prisons, like many state agencies, don't have good data. Sometimes when they do, it's just wrong. It's not collected well. Sometimes it's, it's blatantly dishonest, misleading, or simply false. So, um, I, I mean, anyone that follows me on Twitter can see me ranting repeatedly about prison data in almost every context. Um, I don't get any data from a prison that I just sort of trust on its face, even like really basic shit. So I don't know if that answers, I think that answers that question. All right, um, did you take advantage of any educational opportunities which were available? And did that set you on your current path? So I did not have, um, I don't think we had any college options at the prisons that I was at that I qualified for. Um, the there are some college options in prisons. They're very limited. Um, they're like, and when I say limited, I mean, usually it's like a really small number of people. Um, I actually, if you look back on my timeline, I just tweeted something today um, that one of my friends who I did time with um, got out and wrote, a, a, she wrote something for the New York Daily News about prison education. And she was commenting how she did, um, she did get into a college program in prison. And she was talking about how it's a prison with like 300 people and 15 women in this program. So um, the, the educational opportunities that exist are, you know, great, but um, limited. Um, I was also extremely close to finishing my degree. And I knew that I was doing about 21 months. And in that time got moved around enough. I don't think I was even in one prison for long enough to have even finish a single semester. Um, so instead, I got put in a vocational class, um, horticulture. Plants basically look at me and die on the spot. Like that was useless to me. But you're required to be in some vocational class. You know, you have to be in GED. In New York, you had to be in like GED or vocational class or a job. So I did this, whatever, six month vocational class. And I had to do a drug treatment class, which I did not actually benefit from either. Um, and then I had to do, um, you know, I was just working other than that, I was working at the gym. Um, so I, I didn't, I didn't really benefit from any of the programs. I do think prison programs are important. Um, I think it'd be great if they were, you know, more meaningful or helpful. Um, I think that a lot of the uh, drug rehab type programs they have are, um, inherently problematic. Um, a lot of them are based on a sort of um, therapeutic community model that is not very trauma aware or trauma centric or, you know, I, I mean, if, if your model of treatment is having 
um, people scream at you. Like that's not really helpful for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, there's a number of different programs. I don't think I really benefited from any of them, although I was required to do them. But I want to be clear, I'm not saying prison programs are bad. It just what, wasn't helping me. So, so was your major in college already journalism? No, uh, they didn't have a journalism major there. And um, it seems that the sun has shifted. I am sorry, that is glaring. Um, I, they didn't have a journalism major there. I majored in English and I also wrote for the student newspaper, the Cornell Daily Sun. Um, and so, I mean, I knew that I had an interest in journalism, but I didn't have a degree in it. I still don't have a degree in it. I didn't go to, you know, journalism grad school or anything. Um, and I was just incredibly lucky when I got out that there was an editor who was willing to hire me and give me a chance based on my college journalism clips. Okay, all right, I have another question for you here. Um, so this is from Robert Gordon. He says, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. You seem to feel the indoctrination process on those convicted should be improved. What else would benefit the rehabilitation efforts that you talked about? Um, so I think that, I think that, um, you know, as, as, as you picked up on that, I was sort of implying, I think the culture of prisons is sort of inherently not rehabilitative, but I think the other thing is that, uh, re-entry, I've been thinking about re-entry a lot lately. Um, and, you know, I actually was just sort of arguing with someone about, about re-entry on Twitter or about, um, about you know jobs for people who've done time, but I think that um, reentry part of it is huge. Like when you get out, the biggest things that people need are just so difficult. Like you need housing and transportation, medical care, and a job. And you know these are for me all of those things were so key to getting my life back on track. Um, having a job and having something else that I could really pour myself into has so much to do with how I've been able to stay off of drugs um, and how I've been able to feel like I can be productive and like I have something to contribute. And, you know, there's a huge gap between um, where we are and, and having everyone have something even approaching the kinds of opportunities that I've had. And, you know, so much of that is about the reentry part of it. I mean, honestly, for prison, I feel like to some extent, it would just be great if we could have prisons that did not additionally traumatize people. Like that's such a low bar, but, um, you know, prison is traumatic in a lot of ways. And if we could have prisons that were, that involved less trauma, didn't make the situation worse, and then more meaningful uh, re-entry tools, like we shouldn't have nonprofits should be needing to fill this gap. Like it's great that they do, but so much re-entry work is done by nonprofits and that shouldn't be how the system works. It shouldn't be nonprofits that are, you know, picking up the mess that the prison system leaves behind. Makes sense, makes good sense. Okay. Um, so this, here's another question. I imagine it'd be hard to compare, but do you feel like women are treated unequally in prison in comparison to how men are treated in prison? And does our current patriarchal system translate to the prison system, in your opinion? Um, I love questions about the patriarchy. I actually have a shirt that says, um, smashing the patriarchy is my cardio. <laughs> So th this is a great question. Um, I mean, prisons, uh, different prison systems, I think, treat women differently in different ways. <laughs> I know that sounded like a weird sentence, but what I mean is that, you know, in some prison systems, um, like in New York, we knew that women didn't get as many opportunities as men did, which is not like, I don't think the system was in, was trying to be sexist in that, but there were more men. So programs that would start, you would, you would start them for the men first because there's more people that are going to be impacted and involved. And we saw that in jail and we saw that in prison as well. And I mean, now in New York, there are no minimum security women's prisons because 
they closed prisons, which is great, but they also closed the only like women's prison that was a minimum. So there's there's all these sort of little ways. I mean, not not little actually. Some some of those things are pretty substantial, um, like the college classes. Uh, when I was in prison in Albion, you could only do a col you could only do college classes if you were under thirty five, and if you were over thirty five, they just like fucking gave up on you. But um, that that was not a rule at the men's prisons. Like I, I don't know why that was a rule at that one women's prison. Um, so you know that so there's these unequal opportunities. Um, but aside from that, I do think that fundamentally. Uh, prisons are typically made for men and by men. Like they are designed with male inmates in mind. You know, it's often largely male correction staff historically. I mean, in some ways, you know, both, both of these things are changing in some ways, but I mean, it's overwhelmingly mostly men that you're designing these places for. And um, Michelle Deitch at, um, at UT has done some great work around gender responsive corrections and what uh, a better women's prison would look like. Um, in Austin, they're trying to rebuild the women's building of the Travis County Jail. It's been a very controversial project because it still involves putting you know, new money and potentially more beds into a jail. Um, but their goal was to make a place that was, um, th that was more responsive to women who do just have different needs. They come in with different sorts of trauma. They come in with different types of crimes typically. Um, and, you know, they are going to respond differently to being yelled at by a male sergeant, for instance. Um, so, so yes, I, I think patriarchy is baked into the system. And I think that people are only sort of in recent years um, becoming aware of that. I, I, I actually also wrote about this too in, um, and in a story that was published in a book recently, which was very cool, um, but it's called, can we build a bigger, or can we build a better, not bigger, who wants bigger? Um, can we build a better women's prison? Um, it ran in the Washington Post magazine in like 2019. So you can look that up if you want more on women, you know, gender responsive corrections and women in prison. All right, thanks. Um, how were you able to break the stigma that prison gave you when trying to get a job and turn that into a strength? Um, that was actually not voluntary. I, um, the first time that I, I did not, when I got out, I wanted to, um, I, I played with the idea that maybe I wanted to write a book, but I basically wanted to just get on with my life, which is what a lot of people do. I was not planning to be out about um, having a felony or having been to prison, um, but my arrest was a pretty big arrest for Ithaca. And at some point there was a local reporter who was looking to write a story about the increase in heroin use in the area and um, reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, we're gonna use you in this story. And I didn't, I, I didn't want any part of that. You know, I was like, could, could you not? And, you know, he was like, no, nah, no, my editor's gonna make me, hey, look, if you don't interview, I'm gonna have to just use whatever we have on file about you from the original stories about your arrest. And if you don't provide a new picture, I'm probably gonna have to run with your mugshot, which is a really shitty way to approach it. It sounds very blackmail-y, right? Um, but I also, as a reporter, I get it. Like he, he was right. Like his, his editor was 100% going to be like, well, if we're writing about the increase in heroin use, you cannot not mention one of the, you know, bigger heroin arrests of a Cornell student, no less. So I get where he was coming from, but it ended up forcing me to realize that um, I could either not be out about this and have the, always have the possibility that it was gonna come up as like a sort of gotcha, or I can tell my story on my own terms and I can, you know, put it out there. And, you know, I realized that I was gonna have to lean into that um, because living in Ithaca at that time, it was gonna keep coming up, um, you know? So I did, I've been very lucky that it's worked out. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure what have 20 years ago. I think a lot of this is about, um, you know, where we are in our thinking about criminal justice right now that is even possible 
for someone to be out about having a felony and figure out a way to fit in a field where that's not a hindrance. Um, you know, it's not just journalism, obviously, it's not just criminal justice journalism that allows you to, um, to, to make your plot past a building block like this. I mean, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of jobs in nonprofits and in policy work um, where, you know, there's a bigger sort of space to deal with criminal justice policy where this sort of background can actually um, almost be a benefit in a very narrow space. So um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it wasn't it wasn't willing that I decided to, you know, put this out there and make this a part of, um, you know, what my career path ended up being. Uh, but it's very lucky, and I think part of it's just about timing. Well, so real quick, uh, what would what would your career path have been if it wasn't this? Do you, did you have any idea? Well, I think it would have been journalism still, but I don't think um, I don't think it would have necessarily been criminal justice journalism or even I mean, I think at some point I would have been like, yeah, maybe criminal justice, but I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought I was going to be so open about my own past or make that sort of part of the way that I tell stories. Yeah. OK, question here. Besides covering dentures and getting that policy change with your journalism, are there any other policies you've gotten passed? or plans of getting policies passed? And is your journalism just for coverage and awareness or actual evidence for policy change? Um, so yes, there are other um, stories that I've told, you know, stories that I've written that have had impact. Um, let's see, I, I know I keep a list here somewhere on my computer for when I feel useless. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wrote about, um, I wrote about this public defender who was trying to get more books for the jail. And um, she had been like literally photocopying pages of books and mailing them to clients. And then I wrote about how she was doing a book drive online and it, you know, she ended up getting a ton of donations and they started this um, book club at the Harris County Jail um, pre-pandemic. Um, and it, it was just really cool to see that sort of balloon into these um, bigger uh, reading efforts. And, you know, another lawyer started one for men. And um, that, was, that was a really cool thing to see because I think that um, access to reading is so important in prison um, when there's, you know, so little positive to do. Um, you know, I've also, I also wrote about, there was a disciplinary quota system in Texas prisons where, um, where the officers at one prison had been told like you have to write up this many inmates per shift or you, know, you get in trouble. And uh, I got an email between officers, uh, between ranking officers discussing that. And it was you know, evidence that this quota system existed, which is something that you know, prisoners have alleged for a long time that they would be getting written up for uh, really trivial things or for things that simply weren't true, um, but it was never provable, right? It's it's notoriously difficult to prove prisoners' claims because, you know, as I said before, it's just hard to collect evidence. Um, in this case, I got an email, um, which somebody leaked to me, and then I confirmed through an open records request, and then I wrote about how they had this disciplinary quota, and um, afterwards, a bunch of disciplinary cases got thrown out. They did a system-wide audit. There was a few people that got, a uh, few officers that got in trouble for it. And in the course of investigating it, they also found that there were some officers who'd been planting evidence in a guy's cell. They put uh, screwdrivers in this one guy's cell and screwdrivers are, you know, you, you, you can't have screwdrivers in prison, it's a weapon. Um, and so they ended up, some of them got fired. Um, and some of them ended up getting criminally charged. Um, and then the prisoner question ended up suing them and settled last year in the middle of the pandemic, he ended up settling that suit. Um, wasn't a ton of money, but you know, it was, um, I mean, it, I haven't seen that many successful lawsuits for claims like that. Um, you know, I can keep, I can keep listing things, but, um, oh, the food too, I should say the food. <laughs> when I was talking about the, um, 
bad food during lockdowns and how I'd been getting some pictures of it when I wrote that story. And if you Google, if you want to see the story, um, it was called something like, ew, what is that? And if you Google like my name and that and the Marshall Project, it should come up and you can see these pictures of these really disgusting greenish hot dogs and like unidentifiable like diarrhea looking whatever it is on bread. Um, and after I wrote that, then some of the units started getting more vegetables because I started getting dudes sending me, you know, better looking pictures that were more edible. Um, still a long ways to go. I still get a lot of complaints about food, but it seems that after that story, there was some improvement in what they were serving in some places. So, you know, I've written, I mean, I've written a lot of things that have had varying degrees of impact. Some are small things, some are bigger things. I don't, um, I don't have like an agenda. Like I'm not like, oh, the food is bad. How can I prove that there is a story that will get them better food? Um, that's sort of not the mission of journalism, um, which I think you understood from your question. Um, but you know, as an investigative reporter, um, I'm looking to shine light on things, you know, uncover things that haven't been reported or that aren't publicly known. When I was writing for the Chronicle and I was doing like some amount of just straight news coverage, I would do those kinds of stories like person X got sentenced to death row today or whatever. And I would also do the stories that are like investigating, you know, do prisoners get dentures? Um, and now that I'm at an outlet that does primarily investigative stuff, I'm doing a lot more of the sort of, um, you know, uncovering shining light in dark places and a lot less of the sort of, here's what happened today in the news. Um, so I don't have an agenda other than to expose the truth. So here's a couple more personal questions. What helped you get over your addiction to meth? And um, were, uh, were you in any programs after being released or, or were you left to figure that out on your own? And then a, another question that someone asks is, what was some of your motivation while you were in prison? So I guess let's take the first one first. What, what helped you get over your addiction to meth and were you in any programs? So, um, so my primary addiction was heroin. I did also do meth. I did anything you would put in front of me. Um, and I, I think people think I did math if they looked at my mugshot because I like picked up my face and all and the scabs all over it and looks like I was doing math. Um, but in any case, I, you know, I was at a point in my addiction, I think, where I think where I knew things had gotten really bad. And I mean, this is years of like having been off and on the street and like, you know, done sex work and just I'd been in some bad places, but. I was starting to get to an age where I was like finally starting to sort of get sick and tired of it. And then after I got arrested, there's a few things that happened in those first few months that um, I think solidified my desire to not go back to that lifestyle. Um, one of them was, um, I remember at one point in the jail, I was just sitting there writing letters at the table and I suddenly realized that it was really quiet in the cell block. And I looked around and I realized that it was because, you know, some people had like gone out to visit a wreck or whatever, and everyone else was sleeping because they were high because they'd been getting like, you know what? I am so glad that that's not me right now. I am so glad that I don't have to worry about, am I going to get caught? Am I going to get drug tested? Am I going to be dope sick if I don't get more? And I'm content in this moment to just be sitting here nicely writing a letter to someone, like no drama. Um, and, you know, being on the other side of it, being the one person in the room sober instead of the one person who was like a really high train wreck was a great feeling. So that was one moment. And then um, at the same time, I was also dating someone that I'd been dating out in the free world and we've been getting high together. And um, we actually, I met, we made the terrible decision to get married while I was in jail. So I got married in a jail visiting room, which like zero out of 10 do not recommend. Um, but at one point he was still continuing to use and you know, and I, I was obviously in jail and not using, and he would come to visit and, and lie to me 
like as if I wasn't gonna know. Um, he was, you know, trying to tell me he was sober. And I was like, you know, I would be understanding if he were like, hey, I'm getting high, I'm gonna get help, I don't wanna keep doing this. Um, but as he came in week after week, and you know, he's like parking diagonal in the parking lot, he's like nodding out during the visits, he's not making sense. And then the one time he came in and um, had clear track marks, like fresh bloody track marks on his arm. And, um, and he said that he had fallen into a pot plant and it stabbed him on his veins only. And I was just like, you know, I don't wanna be that person anymore. I know I've told those stupid, ridiculous lies that absolutely no one believes because they can see you're nodding out, you know? And I didn't, I just didn't wanna be that person anymore. I didn't wanna be embarrassing to myself and to everyone around me. And um, I didn't wanna to have to be like constantly lying. And part of it was seeing him doing this while I was sober that I was like, no, I don't, I don't wanna do that anymore. Um, so I think a lot of me deciding that I wanted to stay sober was because I was at a place where I was ready to be. I think if I'd gotten arrested a year earlier, I would have kept getting high in jail because you know, make no mistake, you can get high in jail pretty easily. You can get high in prison. I had people offer to, you know, deliver heroin and needles to my bedside. Um, but I was, by the time I got arrested, I think I was at a place where I was ready to not, not do that anymore. Um, Thanks. What was the second part of the question? Was there a oh, second another, part? I didn't. There was another question. We've got quite a oh, few, okay. so we only have a limited amount of time. Okay. So I'm going to sure. try to get through some of these. But okay. uh, what was your motivation to keep going while you were in prison? Um. Jeez, I. Uh, you know, I. I don't know. I think. Um, there were some days where it was really tough. I. I mean. Obviously that's an understatement, but I mean, there was definitely days where I was suicidal. I was in, um, I was in solitary confinement and I, you know, tried to figure out a way that I could kill myself. Um, I got out of solitary confinement and was still depressed, but not suicidal. Um, and, you know, I think that part of it was actually literally just that I was journaling a lot and it was almost like I wanted to see how the story ended. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like it was just a matter of putting one foot in front of the other. Like, it, it's not like, how am I going to get through this work day? You know, it's like, you're just waiting for time to pass. Like, that's all you have to do in prison, right? You, you just, time has to successfully pass. So like succeeding in prison, like it's a really low bar. Like you just have to let time happen. And um, I think that part of it was sort of wanting to, you know, see how this, wanting to see the rest of my own story, if that makes any sense. Um, I actually haven't really thought through this question before. I've never quite been asked this one. So good job. So let me ask you. So you know, every, every, I think we all want to think that, okay, you went in, you got out, you served your time, you're out, you're successful, you know, you've got a, a good job, uh, influential. What, what are some of the lingering effects for you today uh, in terms of your mental health, uh, in terms of, you, you know, your addiction? What, how, do, how does that affect you today? Um, you know, I... Um... Well, there's a few things. I mean, first of all, there's, you know, what you didn't mention is that the other collateral consequences, right? Um, I mean, I can vote. Um, that was always a rumor that you couldn't vote, but you can once you're off paper and I'm off paper. Um, but I still have a hard time finding decent housing. A lot of um, apartment complexes will uh, have these ridiculously long bans for people with criminal backgrounds. Um, so currently I, um, I'm at a friend's house because my place is, um, has like black mold and cockroaches and shit um, because that was about the best I could find with, um, with a felony. Um, it's proven to be very difficult in Texas. You know, and there's all sorts of other restrictions, obviously. Um, you know, obviously you, you get asked these things when you're applying for jobs, although that hasn't mattered as much in journalism. I haven't actually really been asked that much in journalism. But personally, um, I mean, I think that 
like I said before, prison is a very, is, is an inherently traumatic experience. I mean, the whole point is to keep someone in a kennel, basically, which is not a situation that like people are designed to be in, right? Um, and, you know, that's dehumanizing and traumatic. And it's the sort of thing that I think you realize more and more over time, the sort of impact that has on how you see yourself and how you view yourself. Um, but also for me, like the time that I spent in solitary confinement was extremely traumatic for me. I, um, I really lost, um, I lost touch with reality, kind of like I was losing track of time. You know, I like spending time alone and people say, oh, I like spending time alone. I wouldn't mind solitary. Well, solitary is really more like being, um, you know, to use a philosophy metaphor, a brain in a vat or like being buried alive. Like, you know, you're, you're, it's like, you're just a, a mind in a room and, and that's it. And it's a very disorienting, you know, it's a bright white room with neon lights and no clock. And um, the thing that was, that stuck with me was that, was how quickly I sort of lost touch with reality. And that's scary to realize that your grip on reality is not as, as tight as you thought it was. Um, so I've had, um, somebody called it a, you know, post-prison trauma. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, like p prison PTSD, basically. Like I, I've definitely had some ongoing um, anxiety and fear around solitary confinement and, you know, incarceration in general. Um, and I think it's something that you actually, that actually sort of sits in more over time, like the further I am away from it, instead of being like, oh, it's now less traumatic. It's like, I almost now more appreciate how terrible some of it is and what that trauma really looks like. So, um, and I'm lucky, I know that I'm lucky. I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky that I've rebuilt a life that I have, um, you know, that I'm not still in prison, that I'm not, you know, still on parole. Um, but even in the best case sort of scenario, uh, you know, prison sticks with you. I'm sure it does. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. Um, outside of the prison, no. Okay. Have you investigated about why guards act the way they do, why they shut water off and lie about the time, uh, which this person believes adds to the trauma of being in prison? Any thoughts on that? I think that that's a difficult thing to sort of investigate because it's very subjective, right? Um, I know a lot of officers, some of whom are sources, um, plenty of them, I should say, are, are not like that. Um, but it doesn't, they don't all need to be. You only need one person to lie to, lie to you about the time out of a hundred. And it's still, it, you know, you still don't know what fucking time it is, right? You only need one person to turn off your water. The other 99 can be great. Um, but, you know, I think that people come into that kind of work for very different reasons. Some of them, really don't like it and don't feel that they have an alternative after a certain point. Some of them, you know, really want to be the person in the system that manages to help people that, you know, um, you know, helps make sure that your water gets turned back on, right? Um, and then some people just, you know, I wanna say are just assholes, but that's almost too glib. Um, you know, some people are just not compassionate. You know, um, I don't think there's a deeper answer than that in terms of like why some some people in power would behave this way. I think it's the same sort of questions you might ask about like police or, you know, any sort of authority type position. Like some people do it for, for great reasons and maybe they succeed and maybe they don't. Some people just don't do it for good reasons. So do you, do you support the idea that we should abolish the entire prison system and replace it completely with rehabilitation centers? Um, I, um, I feel like as a reporter, it's um, not right for me to weigh in on um, whether abolition is a good idea, like, or whether it works. Like, I, like, I feel like I can't cover prisons and say they should never exist. Like, just like I can't, you know, I don't know, cover the 
president and say he shouldn't be president, right? Um, which I'm absolutely not saying. Um, but uh, I do think that one thing I do I will talk about and have talked about before is the the tension between um, reform and uh, abolition, which I mm -hmm. I think is a difficult and you know important uh, important thing to think through. Um, I have you know I interact with a lot of abolitionists in the course of my coverage. Um, and I think it's, uh, when we're thinking about things like abolition, I think it's really important to not forget the people who are in there now. Um, and maybe the goal is abolition, um, but sometimes you might actually need to do things that might look like investing in the current infrastructure in order to just make sure that the people there now don't die. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying yes or no on abolition. I don't think that's professional for me. Um, but I am saying that in the meantime, on the path to whatever is in the future, it's really important to understand that, um, to remember the people that are inside now and, you know, no amount of decarceration is going to actually get all of them released now. So we have to think about the conditions that they're living in and the opportunities we're giving them and you know how they can rebuild their lives afterwards. So uh, person wants to know, did you personally experience racism in prison? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was not, I, like I, I don't feel like I was um, discriminated against for being white. Um, but did I see other people um, treated differently? Like, yeah, I like, shit, there's one prison that there was a guard that had like a, you know, had a tattoo of a, like, of a black person in a noose. Um, I did not see this tattoo. This was, um, you know, I did not get close to this guard. Um, but I, you know, this was sort of, this, this guard was sort of infamous for that. Um, but, you know, also, I mean, there are times where you would see, like, I can think of situations where I saw prisoners of color getting sent to shoe for very trivial things that I had gotten away with all the time. The difficulty in saying, like, that's racism or, or it isn't, like, I, you know, it seems like it is, but it's anecdotal. And, you know, you don't have, until you get out and sort of afterwards look at the data and go, oh, that, that was anecdotal, but it's actually symptomatic of you know, a larger, um, a larger problem. Um, I, I, I think it was difficult in that moment to draw conclusions about what I was seeing until I got out and saw the data. Okay. All right, uh, so here's a good question for you. What could be a, um, oh, wait a minute. Are there any good prison systems, system practices from around the world that you think the US could incorporate? Um, I mean, you know, I think that people hold up Norway as being um, a great model. Um, I think I haven't really talked to Norwegian prisoners firsthand um, because to me, that's a huge part of understanding like a prison can look nice and great. And it seems like they have a lot going for them in Norway and the data seems to bear that out. Um, but, you know, I, I would want, if I were going to make any sort of declarations about like, do I think this works or not? Like, you know, it's, it, to me, it's, it, it's really important to talk to the people who are actually in that system or who are going through that system. Um, I do think in the US, the Colorado Department of Corrections um, seems to be doing some really great stuff. Um, I don't know where that ends. Like it, I, I don't know uh, if their incarceration and recidivism numbers are going to look better than the rest of the country in a decade. Um, I actually don't even know how they compare to um, most other states now in terms of like recidivism. But um, they did a, a really fabulous, um, they did a really fabulous presentation over, maybe presentation is underselling it. They did a thing, um, an arts program during the pandemic. They have robust arts programming in all of their prisons and it's kind of amazing. Um, they have TVs in every cell, first of all, which is, um, you know, which, which is the kind of like access to information, even limited, information that many prison systems don't have. 
but they also have arts programs. They have um, a podcast. They do, uh, they have an inmate written newspaper with like bureaus at every prison. Um, they have some theater programs and the theater program put together this presentation, which if you check it out on YouTube, um, Denver, it's, it's University of Denver. It's on their YouTube page and it's called Life Inside and it's about four hours, um, but there's two, two spots of it that were really cool. And one was they did a hip hop apocalyptic retelling of Antigone. It's only like 10 or 15 minutes. I, um, it's, I, I forget that one's like 45 minutes in or so. Um, and then they did this interview based um, theater performance about, uh, you know, a, a, about sort of second chances and, and um, and, you know, regret, I guess. Um, it was really moving though. And it was also really impressive to see that there was any American prison system that was willing to let prisoners participate in making this happen during a pandemic. Um, you know, they were willing to go to lengths to, to do this, to let people communicate through Zoom and things like that, which is something that many prison systems were slower to do. Um, they were willing to continue offering programs at a time when so many other prisons shut them down. And the product is truly amazing. Like you watch this and there's some parts of it that are meh, but there's some parts that you're like, this doesn't look like it was made in a prison. I'm not saying the Colorado prison system is amazing, but I am saying that when I look at things like that, I think like it'd be great if more prison systems in the US could do that because that seems like um, the sort of, you know, thing that could be, you know, very meaningful to, to people on the inside. So we have a, just a few minutes left and when I, I'm gonna shotgun some questions to you. You mentioned your dad was a lawyer. Did he play a role in your release or any any part of your story? No, he doesn't do, he, he didn't do um, criminal law, never has. I don't think he really understood if my charges were serious or not. He was also a lawyer in another state. He does um, like business law, like he's on like the local zoning board um, and does other things that I think are the boring kind of law. So how long did you stay in solitary confinement? So I was incredibly lucky in that I was only in for a few days at a time. I was in once for like three or four days and that was just for medical clearance and classification. Um, and then I was in again for medical clearance and classification at a different jail when they moved me. And um, once because I was wrongly accused of having drugs in my cell when I did not. Okay. Um how, based on your experience, how would you rate prison life from prisons here in Texas versus New York? Well, you know, I don't, I've never actually done time in Texas, but I think it is not a big stretch to say that, you know, Texas prisons are uh, worse by a number of metrics. Um, but there's some ways in which New York prisons are surprisingly uh, worse. Um, like, at the time that I was in, New York prisons were using solitary confinement more than Texas prisons were, um, which is sort of you know counterintuitive. Um, also, I think you did more of your time before you could get released in New York typically than in Texas, um, but you would tend to get shorter sentences in New York. So, um, you know, I I do think that doing time in Texas is harder, if nothing else, because of the food and the heat. Um, but also like you pay for medical care here. You didn't have to pay for medical care in New York. Also, you got paid to work. Not a lot, you're getting paid eight or nine cents an hour, but you don't get paid at all in Texas. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a number of metrics by which Texas is a much harder place to do time than New York. And our last question for the day is, um, do you have a current project or article that you're working on at the moment? Yes, I do. I always do. I have several. Um, I first of all, I'm you know working on a book which uh, is not going to come out until the spring of next year, um, and I am working on um, I'm working on an article on death row. This is a sort of longer term project. It's a magazine length article. I don't want to give too much away, but I'm very excited about it. Um, it's probably a few months off. And I have a, a, a different magazine article that is about Huntsville as a prison town, um, as sort of told through the story of one family 
Um, and then I have some other things that I'm, I'm working on about um, food and teeth in other states and um, prison construction. Um, so, you know, I always have a few different stories. I also just, um, you know, constantly gathering thread on other stories. You know, somebody calls me, I interview them, I put it away for later for whatever story it fits into in the future. So yeah, I have a lot of stuff. Okay, and so how can people get keeping, how can people follow you? Well, I am on Twitter more than I should be. <laughs> um, I'm at K-E-R-I-B-L-A um, on Twitter. And if you want to email me, it's Carrie, K-E-R-I, at themarshallproject.org. Um, you know, or you can um, find me on Facebook or, I mean, I guess Instagram if you want. Um, so yeah, I'm reachable. I'm here. All right, Carrie, thank you so much. Um, for your time today and answering all of the questions that we had, you, you, you really, uh, I mean, you know, I think the, bet, the, the plus, if there's any of your time in prison is what you're doing now after prison. And um, I think that's an inspiring story for a lot of people, no matter our field of interest. So thank you, thank, thank you, you for your time. And thank you for the work that you do. And thank you for shining a light where a light has not been shown before. Um, we appreciate you. And uh, so everyone, you've heard it. Carrie, can you say it one more time? If you want to follow Carrie, where she can be found on Twitter at? At K-E-R-I-B-L-A. I also see there's a lot of questions here that I didn't get to. So anyone, um, I, I'm probably not going to go through them all, but feel free to DM me or email them to me. Um, email is K-E-R-I at themarshallproject.org. So K-E-R-I at the marshallproject.org. And if anyone forgets any of this, you can feel free to uh, uh, email me or Dr. Um, or Dr. Buckler, and we can get you that information. Um, all right. So everyone, thank you so much. Um, and we will see you next month. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. <laughs>